Hello everybody and welcome to the latest episode of The Surge. My name is Saud and today we'll be talking about two of what I call gray zones. So they're not really gray zones in my book. I think that it's fine to deal with so long as you're good at acute medicine. But they're gray zones for many pediatricians because they fall somewhere between what is felt to be surgical and what is felt to be medical in many ways. And uh, those are uh, traumatic brain injuries and I'm not sure whether it's called drowning or near drowning so we'll have that discussion in about three or five minutes or something like that but being in water and, and, and having a uh, compromised respiratory system as a result um, because the the literature is all over the place with that, but the guidelines are very clear on what the priorities should be. And again, I'm not going to go through PALS and ATLS with you. I'm just going to go through some of the pitfalls that I found challenging at least. So uh, the aims in the emergency room for any uh, pediatric head trauma are to secure the airway, to diagnose and begin the initial treatment for any raised intracranial pressure, and uh, to develop an approach for stable patients neurologically, i.e. patients with what would be considered a significant mechanism and are maybe quote-unquote okay. And the reason why this is very important is because the number one missed injury in pediatric trauma is head trauma. And the number one cause of death in pediatric trauma is head trauma. So we need to work on that as a community, right? And I do agree with you. Head traumas in kids, they're tough. They're not easy. And, you know, the comfort zone is is, is very wide. Uh, for the purposes of how to intubate, I'll probably do a dedicated talk. I have some details in the airway episode and other details in the pediatric trauma patterns of injury episode about three episodes ago. Actually, five now. Uh, well, three or five, I can't remember. But the indications for intubation are intractable seizures, inability to protect the airway due to facial swelling, for example, if you have a combined facial fracture or facial trauma, and dropping GCS to a GCS below 8. Now, there is a documented pediatric modification for the Glasgow Coma Score, and the key um, difference is in the infant below one year, and that cooing and babbling is okay, but it, being irritable and consolable drops you by a point. And persistent crying is considered more and more worrisome. Moaning and a complete lack of response is considered very, very worrisome. And in fact, what's considered the most important part of the GCS is the verbal in terms of detecting sensitivity for something that's clearly wrong with the brain. In terms of prognosis, it's actually the motor in both adult and pediatrics, okay? Now, the concern that I have is that when we look at this curve for intracranial volume and pressure, we understand the Monroe Kelly doctrine and that this is a closed space and something has to be pressed in and out. And then once you reach the maximal distensibility, you no longer can push something in and out. This raises your ICP and uh, affects certain centers in the brainstem uh, and the surrounding area, and that eventually leads to uh, papillary dilation and subsequent cardiorespiratory compromise, right? We know that the pupil dilating is the first sign of increased intracranial pressure, and we know this, this curve pretty well. The drop in GCS is the continuum from the critical volume where the ICP rises exponentially all the way to when the bleeding first starts. Now, I use the word bleeding here because I have a problem. In some places, and I'm sure that I'm talking and preaching to the choir here, but in some places, because the patient seems quote-unquote fine, the sense of urgency in doing the CT scan is not there i.e. the patient can wait and be observed, or something of that nature. There are guidelines for that. They're called the PCON guidelines. But you have to be cognizant. Your middle meningeal artery, 
is as big as your radial artery. If you have a small tear in the radial artery, it may stop. If you have a complete transection of a three to five millimeter vessel, what are the chances of it stopping? It's very low. If you have a significant amount of your cardiac output going to your brain, far higher than you would for the radial artery, okay? A significant percentage goes to the brain. It's a very high percentage. We're not going to go into details. I might do neurophysiology as a dedicated episode because I find it very interesting and I have no life. But if you have a, let's say, two cc's every 15 minutes, how fast do you think you're going to reach that critical volume? So in my mind, it's not intracranial pressure versus intracranial volume. It's intracranial pressure versus rate of bleeding. And when you look at the literature, it kind of mirrors that, in that you can have subdurals that can last for a week before having any changes and are fairly benign and may not require drainage. And you can have epidurals that have a complete transection in the middle meningeal artery and require draining like lula, like right now. Okay. And the difference is the rate of the bleeding. But you can also have a third problem, which is your intraparenchymal hemorrhages. So your subarachnoid and your intraparenchymal hemorrhages. And the reason why is because once you're under the dura, once you're under the, 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 the arachnoid, sorry, once you're under the arachnoid, every bleed that's of traumatic origin will release some tissue factor locally. And that tissue factor increases the rate of coagulopathy, which increases the rate of bleeding locally, which is why supplementing with FFP might be a good idea in adults. I use the word might because there's only been one paper that tested it on rodents, but I would suspect that time to FFP will be another critical factor in managing hemorrhage, especially in the brain. Now, going back to the critical volume, that part of the curve, the critical volume part of the curve, is when you start to get papillary dilation. So there's an 80-20 rule and there's a 90-10 rule. Both of those rules mean the same thing that there is a percentage chance that it's on the ipsilateral side. The percentage chance is low. It varies between 10 and 20%, depending on which book you read and what population you study. And the vast majority of the time, it's on the contralateral side. If the left side blows, the right side of the brain is affected and vice versa. Whenever you see this, if you have no bleeding anywhere else, the first line therapy that's been recommended by guidelines is 0.5 to 1 gram per kilogram of mannitol, which is an extremely powerful diuretic and an urgent neurosurgical consult is required. However, if you have some bleeding in the abdomen or in the chest, which happens, like we said before, about 40% of the time in our patterns of injury uh, lecture, especially in high-velocity injuries of unseat-belted patients. If you do have that, then you might want to use hypertonic saline because hypertonic saline can be volume-expanding to an extent while maintaining osmolarity enough to reduce the amount of edema. Now, when you open the textbooks, there are some caveats. There are some type of bleeds where you don't want to use hyperosmolar therapy. That is, by and large, theoretical. It's kind of like uh, not using ketamine to intubate intracranial hemorrhage. Yes, if you test it on rodent models, there is a response. Does that two or three seconds of hypertension or raised ICP have a major impact later on down the line? Hard to tell, hard to know. No clear data says that it's bad. Is there a risk to intubating while the patient's awake, having them being more agitated and raising their ICP? Absolutely. So it's the same thing with the hypertonic saline. Yes, there is a risk that by reducing the edema in the parenchyma, you're allowing the vein and the artery to bleed more. But the logic behind that is that the brain is going to tampon out the bleed that's happening in the dura or between the dura and the arachnoid. How likely is that? Like, how often do you see, knowing this curve, things go that way? That the brain, by not decompressing the brain, it's going to tampon out itself. It's very hard to do, right? It doesn't. It just doesn't gel with me. I don't feel it physiologically. I may be wrong, and I probably am wrong. And people with three neurosurgery fellowships, 
can argue with me and I will gladly have you on the show. I'm working out the software. I'm going to start getting guests on. It'll be great because I really want to have real debates on the show at one point. But for me, like I said, my suspicion, my concern is that not treating it and waiting for it to tampon out when you have a blown pupil may not be a good strategy. Now, in terms of imaging, okay, there's the PCARN rule or guideline, and this has the minimum number of missed injuries for the head that's been reported in the literature. And it's been designed not to miss injuries. So it's not designed to lower the number of CT scans that your department does. Okay? That isn't what this is here for. No imaging guideline or test will ever be designed to make our job easier as physicians in terms of the workload that we do. It's designed to make it safer, safer for us to treat our patients. That's what these guidelines are designed with the intent to do. They're not supposed to replace your workload or let you leave earlier. They're supposed to, or they're designed to give you something to work with so that you don't miss an injury, okay? Despite your workload. So below the age of two years, any palpable skull fracture, in fact, above and below the age of two years, so the red category, altered mental status, any GCS below 15 that's been witnessed or a palpable skull fracture gets a CT scan. Okay. Any witness loss of uh, consciousness greater than five seconds. Any non-frontal hematoma. So anything that's happening in the occiput, temporal area, anywhere like that. Any changes to the patient acting normally or severe headache. And any significant mechanism. Can be observed for three hours or can get a CT scan. The only patients that don't get a CT scan are those with a GCS of 15 over 15, witnessed and recalled event, with no clear signs of a hematoma and no clear signs of a severe mechanism, who have been acting completely normal after observation. Okay. Now, here they define severe mechanism as uh, MVC, PED versus car, uh, car rollover, unhelmeted uh, bike injury, or a fall of three feet, okay, uh, for the less than two years and five feet for the greater than two years. I would contend that looking at uh, trauma kinematics uh, data, and actually there's another episode coming up on that. When you look at trauma kinematics, it's how tall the child is, double it. 1.5 to double it, okay? That would be my rule for that. My personal advice is, if you're thinking about doing it, do the CT, okay? Here are some examples. Uh, as you can see, epidurals or extradurals are convex. That's how I remember them. Extra and convex, they both have X's. Subdurals are concave. They have an acute and chronic element because they're by and large venous. Subarachnoids and parenchymal hematomas usually have a bigger penumbra of bleeding. They call blossoming in the neurosurgical literature. And when you have a blossoming bleed, it's by and large, like I said, because of tissue factor and local anticoagulating agents. These are the same things that stop you from getting strokes. Okay. Then you have diffuse brain swelling and diffuse axonal injury. So what's important is to note the GCS before intubation in these two categories, diffuse brain swelling and diffuse axonal injury. Because unlike in the adult, in kids, the outcomes are pretty favorable. So in the adult, you read about diffuse axonal injury, you look at the CT scan, like that CT for diffuse brain swelling, there are places where they won't even get treated, okay, because their prognosis is so poor. Like, there are places where I've had, like, I've been at meetings where I've had people, world-renowned people, address me about diffuse axonal injury like it's brain death. That's all it is. It's it's like it's tantamount to brain death almost. Prognostically, it's the worst. I'll be honest with you, you never know. And I don't think that anybody knows. Even if you do an MRI that proves diffuse axonal injury, we're not sure how to deal with it yet. We have a scoring system, but the scoring system tells us the prognosis over 90 days. And there are outliers, but the outliers are less than 30%. So I'm not sure where the jury is on that. But I would suspect that kids with diffuse axonal injury and diffuse swelling, you know, they do better. 
uh, than the adults. And n n not to publish the paper before it's published, uh, but uh, stay tuned for a paper that we're working on, looking at our own demographics here in Kuwait from the uh, trauma center I'm responsible for. Uh, it looks like uh, our diffuse axonal uh, injury rate and our diffuse swelling rate in kids after a certain age cutoff, without giving it out, tend to do better and worse. So they tend to do better if they're younger and worse if they're older in general, right? But, you know, you'll have to wait for the paper. And don't forget your adjuncts. So seizure prophylaxis for those who are high risk. So significant midline shift, witness seizure within the first seven days. Repeat the imaging. Typically, we like to repeat it within uh, six hours of clinical deterioration, 24 hours otherwise. And what to do about isolated skull fractures? So I wanted to ask everybody online, what do you do when there's only a skull fracture and there is no evidence of a bleed? Do you repeat the imaging or do you only repeat it if it's clinically warranted? Do you admit the patient for observation? Uh, do you do the standard workup for facial fractures, even though it may not be like it could be like a Lefort 4, which is technically a base of skull fracture? fracture. Yeah, I said it. A Lefort 4 is a base of skull fracture, and it's not real facial fracture, but you might want to do a CSF leak test, that type of thing. Let me know your thoughts. I really don't know what to do about isolated skull fractures. Our practice has been to admit them for 24 hours and then discharge them afterwards. Unless it's clinically warranted, there's a clinical deterioration. There is another paper on that that we're looking at. We just haven't had accurately yet. Moving on, the next subject I wanted to talk about was drowning. So drowning is important, especially in countries like the one I'm working in right now, because we're by the beach. And one of the pet peeves that I have with drowning is that people have different names for it at different stages. So I've heard everything from saltwater drowning, contaminated drowning, near drowning, wet drowning, freshwater drowning. I don't know what wet drowning is, but it was in one of the textbooks. Uh, arrest due to drowning, uh, peri drowning, pseudo drowning, near drowning. I, I don't understand, right? Drowning is a process resulting in a primary respiratory impairment due to submersion or immersion liquid medium. The word or the term drowning should be used regardless of the outcome. All right. You can't use words like near drowning, secondary drowning, passive drowning, silent drowning, wet drowning, or dry drowning because they don't exist. Trauma is a mechanism based specialty. Okay. If the water did it to the person, they drowned. The presentation is drowning. So that's the first thing to understand. And it annoys me because it makes the literature less robust. And I really like to practice an evidence-based practice. Like, I really like doing it. I, I like being analytical. I, I, it just makes me more comfortable. Call what you will. Physiologically, the other reason is that physiologically, drowning, near drowning, whatever, vanilla drowning, whatever you want to call it, pseudo drowning, total drowning, whatever. Drowning has a whole spectrum. Okay. Initially, there's a struggle for 20 to 30 seconds. As the patient or as the, the, the victim starts to feel overwhelmed and fatigued, then there's submersion where the airway itself gets below the water surface. Voluntary breath holding can last up to 60 seconds, especially if they have willful knowledge of what's to come. Then a small amount of water gets aspirated slowly. Arterial oxygen tension decreases and laryngeal spasm uh, abates and more water becomes aspirated. As cerebral hypoxemia sets in, you get loss of consciousness and loss of respiratory drive. This eventually leads to a cardiac deterioration and bradycardia. Okay. Because of this spectrum, the current guidelines around the world, and this is just one example from the Australasian College, all advocate for starting APLS and having a low threshold to be aggressive early. Very few patients will go home within an hour. If your patient comes in completely asymptomatic with no increased work of breathing, you observe them for four to eight hours and consider admission to a short stay unit with or without prophylactic antibiotics, depending on whether the water was dirty or not. If your patient came in 
with any respiratory compromise, including clinical increased work of breathing, ECG changes, changes in their blood work, or changes in their chest x-ray, high flow nasal oxygen should be given to them. You should also consider non-invasive ventilation, hydrate them, keep them MPO just in case they need to be intubated, maintain normal thermia, and start uh, antibiotics and cardiac monitoring accordingly. Okay? If they come in, in arrest or near arrest, then you have to activate your PALS or APLS algorithm. VVG, ABG, full blood work, direct admission to the ICU, and intubate them early. The one thing that's going to reverse their, their cardiac arrest or their apnea is going to be restoration of ventilation. Okay? Now, when you look at respiratory compromise in and of itself, and somebody with normal cardiac function coming in, okay, the indication for endotracheal intubation should be decided early based on respiratory effort and improvement. If you have a lack of improvement within six to eight hours of starting high flow nasal oxygen supplementation, waiting does not help the patient. Okay, waiting does not help the patient. Lung protective measures do. All right, address the hypothermia, and if there's contaminated water, I would augment with ciprofloxacin and whatever antibiotic you use in institutionally if there is one. Okay, then look for why they drowned. Did they drown because of seizures? Did they drown because of a cardiac condition? Did they drown because they have a neurological condition? Did they drown because they were hit by something, a trauma? A secondary trauma. So make sure you do a full primary and secondary survey. Okay. You need to recognize the time that it takes for you to stabilize the patient and resuscitate them. Is the patient's rate of survival. They're directly congruent. The less time the patient spent submerged. And the more time and the less time you require to resuscitate them, the better their outcomes. Okay. The quicker you can get them to a resuscitation room, the better the outcomes. Okay. And that's your reality. Okay. You there have n almost never been good neurological outcomes with a resuscitation time of more than twenty five percent or twenty five minutes, or a submersion time of more than twenty five minutes. Let me repeat that. If, and this is regardless if you're an adult or a child, if your submersion time is more than 25 minutes, and if your resuscitation time, or time to resuscitation, sorry, is more than 25 minutes, including transport time, your chances of survival are extremely, extremely, extremely low. And that's why you need to be very aggressive. The ultimate aim of therapy, in fact, I would say that the ultimate aim of most trauma algorithms in the context of hemodynamic compromise is to provide a fast, effective, aggressive response in a limited amount of time, the shortest amount of time possible. You want to go maximum aggression and minimum amount of time, okay? Early indicators like coma, fixed dilated pupils, low GCS on arrival, none of them count. What counts is, again, how fast you can start appropriate resuscitation and submersion time. This is Saud al -Zaid. Thank you for listening. Um, this concludes our pediatric series, uh, for now at least. Let me know your thoughts. And um, please subscribe.